Um, today I'm going to talk about the Age of Fire witchcraft in 17th century Iceland. Before I do, I'm going to give you just a little bit of background on myself because I'm often asked how on earth did I end up looking at witchcraft and voodoo and if anybody's googled me that's what comes up. Um, my background is actually in illustration and art. I still paint, I'm still an artist and I use art as research as well, which might be a future talk. Um, but for my PhD I researched the representations of voodoo, which was the influence and history of Haitian voodoo. I gave a talk last week about that. Um, and I was fascinated by the curses and the dolls. And that led me to then look at witchcraft, which is where the poppets originate from. So if you think of pins and dolls, it's actually a witchcraft thing, not a, a voodoo thing. And more recently, I started reading about Icelandic witchcraft and I was fortunate enough to have a grant to go out to Iceland to do some work on witchcraft in Iceland, which was before coronavirus, before, just before Christmas. And so this is the start of a new project, really. But what I wanted to do in this talk was to introduce you to Icelandic witchcraft. It's not broadly written about. And hopefully it will just give you a very basic overview. I'm not going into depth. It's not a heavy academic lecture. This is an overview of witchcraft in Iceland. Um, I'd like to thank Verity for arranging this. Um, hopefully it's the start of many more. Um, so let's get going. I'm going to share my screen with you so you can, there's a PowerPoint. And as Verity said, please do put your questions into the Q&A box or I'm going to put my email onto the screen now. Please feel free to email me after the event if you do have any questions. I'm more than happy to answer any. Um, if, if I take a few days, please forgive me. It's, I'm still adapting to life online, even after all these weeks. So, hopefully this will share with everybody. There we go. Okay, so Age of Fire, witchcraft in 17th century Iceland. There's my email address, which is louise.fenton at wlv.ac.uk. I'm also on Instagram and Twitter, um, so you can find me on there as well. So what we're going to look at today is a very brief history of Iceland and how witchcraft came to evolve there, but also to look at the, some of the accused and the accusers and how the whole system worked in Iceland during this period, and a little bit about witchcraft in Iceland today, where the documents are held and what, what's available should any of you be fortunate enough to go out or that you might want to read about it. There's a long tradition in Iceland, thankfully, which is of keeping records in the Landnamabok. And this is a detailed history of Iceland, the life and times from the ninth century and the Icelandic people have a tradition of copying these out. So century after century, these have been copied and added to. So we have a really comprehensive history of Iceland from generation to generation, which is really unusual, but very, very useful. The other thing to mention is that the language, Icelandic language has really remained mostly unchanged. So if you think about old English documents if you're looking at old church records or they're either in Latin or old English and it's sometimes very difficult to read and most languages evolve over time however Icelandic hasn't so if you are looking at these centuries old documents we're really fortunate that somebody could translate them even from today so that's what happened for me. So somebody who is Icelandic today could easily pick up a 10th century document and be able to read it, which is fantastic. Um, I'm not going to go too much into how the name came about for Iceland because there's some contention. Some academics and researchers and historians think it was um, from a, an explorer from somewhere in the um, somewhere from either Denmark or Sweden and originally it was known as Snowland for obvious reasons and then he decided to call it Iceland. Another version is that there were Irish monks resident there and that the word Iceland is just a variation on the word island and that's how it evolved. So there is some controversy over where the name actually came from but we, it's been Iceland for many many centuries. 
Iceland's got the oldest parliament in existence, the Alpingi, which was formed in 934 AD and has been continuous. It's no longer in the rocks in the national park where this flag is that marks the place. And obviously it's in Reykjavik now, but it's actually been in operation since 934 AD, unbroken. And that's really unusual. And the Alpingi was where leaders of all areas of Iceland came together to formulate laws. It was their legal system and it was there to distribute justice as well. So although there were small, so small pockets of justice within each of the regions and in village areas and towns, the Alpingi was there to bring together to make major decisions where all the heads came. The ma magic in Iceland has always existed. It's not been something that suddenly appeared and disappeared. As in many cultures, magic, sorcery, um, herb, use of herbs, traditional ways existed. But in the Viking Age, which is about 800 to 1066, which is documented in the Landranamod book, female practitioners were known as Visendakona, or translated as women of science. And the male practitioners were called sidemen or the men of magic. Um, side meaning magic. Now that's a very simplification because there are women who practice magic, of course there are, and there are scientific men. But these were terms that were given. And in the year 1000, Christianity was announced as the official religion of Iceland. So that's a pivotal point. So the year 1000 is the pivotal point when Christianity was stated as being the religion of Iceland. So why witchcraft in Iceland? As you can see from this map, this is from around the period we're talking about. The areas that are coloured in indicate the veracity of the witch trials and witch hunts and witch persecutions across Europe. So the warmer the colour, the more vehemently they were going after witches. So as you can see, in particular, Scotland and just above it, you can see Iceland, which is a warm orange colour. And in proportion, the population to the number of people who were accused, it was very high. And I'll talk a little bit about the numbers in a moment. But to get on to how, how did witchcraft even get to the island? So, as I said, in, ten, in the year 1000, it was decided that Iceland should reject all its pagan beliefs, all its traditional ways and adopt the new faith of Christianity. Denmark battled to gain Iceland over a period of centuries, but it was inherited in the 16th century. So by the 16th century, Denmark had ownership of Iceland. So laws and governance were under the Danish rule. There were three important, two important books that came out that really had an impact on witchcraft across the whole of Europe. The first one you can see on the left is the Malleus Maleficarum, written in, it was two German um, writers put this together and it's really a handbook on how to identify, persecute, torture and execute witches. It's known, translated as the hammer of witches. You can get translations quite readily, but it's quite a serious publication that circulated around Europe. But bearing in mind that literacy, this was in the 15th century, so literacy was not quite as high, but it became well known. And then in the late 16th century, King James of England stroke Scotland, married a Danish, a Danish aristocrat, so she was um, Anne, and he was in Denmark and they stopped in Iceland on the way back. On their way from Iceland back to Scotland, loads of things happened to them. Trouble befell them all the way and he was convinced that it was witchcraft. He'd read the Malleus Maleficarum, he was very interested and concerned about witchcraft, and as you can see this woodcut in the middle is about this journey of James and Anne coming back to Scotland and it's called News from Scotland. You can see a black figure in a pulpit to the left of the woodcut. That represented um, a school teacher who was believed to be preaching Satanism and he was believed to have a coven of witches within the area. 
you can see the witches brew in their cauldron in the top right hand corner. So every stereotype you can think of to do with witchcraft is in this image. But most importantly is the journey that he made on the sea. And if you look in the top left, it's difficult to see, but you can see a ship. And that ship is surrounded by demons. And he believed that witchcraft had caused storms and these demons were circulating his ship. And it led him to write Demonology, which was his book on how to eradicate witches, how to spot them, how to torture them, how to um, deal with the issue of witchcraft. So by the early 17th century, there were these books in circulation. They were widely read and people in Iceland would have heard of them equally as much as across the rest of Europe. So this period was known as the Age of Fire. What fascinated me most was out of 20 persecutions and executions that actually went through to execution, they were all men apart from one, there was one woman, but they were all men. And although men were executed as witches in Scotland, England, I know Salem, there were men, it was this high proportion that fascinated me. Why would 20 out of 21 executions be men? So I'll, I'll now look at that. So what was the Age of Fire? It was called the Age of Fire because the execution method for eradicating witches was burnt at the stake. So if you think that Iceland at this time would be sparsely populated, it is now, but back then it was even more sparsely populated. The northern area of Iceland, which is the area I'm going to look at in particular, was very late to convert to Christianity and still believed in the Norse magic. So as with everything, it would have been centered around where the, the Alpingi and the, the parliament and Reykjavik, which was the main center, so to spread out right up into the north would have taken a long time and they still practice their beliefs. The first execution of a witch was in 1652 and it was a man. And men held the responsibility of casting or inscribing runes. So although, as I said, there were women who practiced magic, of course there were, but most of the documented cases are men who use runes, which are sim symbols of Norse mythology, and although it's mythology, their stories based on legend, on their gods. So these runes were believed to be helpful. But I say inscribing runes, you've got to think it's things like remote areas that had flocks of sheep. They might carve symbols on the oldest sheep to protect the flock. We might call it superstition today. Then it was classed as inciting magic or sorcery. The other issue with Iceland is that in Europe, the accused tended to be old women, either living alone or living on the fringes of villages or um, tended to be women who helped with midwifery, not always old, but tended to live on their own. But in Iceland, isolation doesn't happen. When the winters hit, a lot of communities, remote communities, start living together. So they lived in these dwellings where a lot of people would live together. So you wouldn't have that isolated old lady or single woman on the edge of the society. They would be part of the community. But men were still out there having to do check on sheep to make sure they were fed, to cultivate, to fish. So it was men that were out on the fringes of society. And this in some ways could go to explain why they were persecuted a little bit more. So they were more at risk. There was a law against witchcraft proclaimed in 1630. But in documents, it shows that many of the elite and the wealthy, especially in the cities, totally ignored this. They use runes, they use magic symbols, they use their superstitions, their pagan beliefs, however you want to describe it. They totally ignored it because they didn't think it applied to them. It only applied to the rural stroke working classes. European methods to accuse or identify witches weren't used in Iceland. So you didn't have the pinprick or the ducking stool or um, looking for witch marks, none of that happened. The evidence was around runes and magical symbols. That was the evidence. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So this is a map of Iceland. 
Oh, sorry, I just want to mention, I, I'll just go back one second. Runes and magical symbols, there is something I need to say there. Um, if magical artifacts were found in the house, that was enough. That was enough to accuse somebody. And when I say magical artifacts, it's not what you would expect. If you think of magical artifacts, you might think of a cauldron or um, some sort of symbols. All that needed to be found was an odd shaped pebble, um, might be runic symbols carved into wood or on the floor markings, might be a magic book where they keep spells written down, but it could be as simple as a strange shaped pebble or a raven's feather and that would be enough. The other way that accusations came about was if somebody didn't like someone, they would just accuse them of being a witch. Um, if they had an accident befall on them or their crops failed or um, their stock started to die, they would just blame somebody they didn't like. It was far harder in Iceland to get out of an accusation than it was anywhere else but it was that simple, that was all it took to actually make the accusation. So my initial research, this, this is where I started. And if you see the pink line, Iceland is quite a vast area, but most of the population is around the edge. Reykjavik is at the bottom left corner, and that's where I started from. And then I drove, Incidentally, if anybody tells you you can't drive in Iceland, that's rubbish. The roads are beautifully smooth tarmac all the way up. I wouldn't want to tackle it in the winter when it's snowy or icy, but summertime into autumn is absolutely fine and it's well worth the journey because it's stunning. So I drove the pink line up and if you look, there's a small area in the top left and that's called the West Fjords. And it's joined by a very thin spit of land and that's where most of the witchcraft accusations, persecutions took place. They were quite concentrated, but that was the last area to adopt Christianity as well. So there was still a lot of superstition. These are very small, tight communities. Something happened, accusations were made. The Helm of Ore features quite prominently in a lot of symbology across Iceland. And I'm fascinated with um, visual culture as well as the social and historical. The Helm of Ore, was a marking which obviously would have been deemed a magical symbol and you would be persecuted for it. But the irony is these days, it, as you can see in the bottom of this map, it's adopted as the symbol for one of the regions, which is called the Strandia region. And they've adopted it now as their symbol. So yeah, things go turn around and change over time. When I first started doing my research, I was told that Holmavik was where everything had happened. All the witch trials were in Holmavik. This is where I needed to go. Most of the things I read kept talking about Holmavik. However, when I got there, I quickly found out it wasn't, it wasn't the main center of witchcraft. It was part of it, but it wasn't the main area. Give you some idea of what these villages small towns, communities were like. This is Holmavik today with a population of around 400 people. Back in the 17th century, the population was probably around 100 to 200 people. So it's, it's quite a small area. Even today, this town has got a shrimp factory. There's a couple of fishing boats, one restaurant. Interestingly, I think they're fed it with fish because it's a pizza and pasta restaurant. Um, there's a supermarket one guest house, one hotel, one post office, one church and one museum, the Museum of Witchcraft and Sorcery in Iceland. So a very small place but beautiful, on the edge of a fjord, well worth a visit and this is the view from where I was staying. So you can understand these communities were very tight-knit and relied on fishing and, and livestock, sheep, that was all they had. So these red dots, as you can see, are where the accusations of witchcraft took place. So there were 200 accusations in total and trials. They start, they're very sparse around the outside of Iceland, but if you look up to the top left, that's the West Fjords and they're quite concentrated. And this was the most rural and sparsely populated and yet the most intense documented cases of witchcraft. This just gives you an idea that if you look, follow the line from the bottom of the image, 
up to the left you see two little clusters one with fire in the middle of it and that's where some of the executions took place just below that is Holmovic so there were actually only four maybe five cases that were brought to trial in Holmovic despite most of what you read stating that Holmovic was the location of witch trials but it was in the West Fjords which was the whole of this area this little region up on the top left of Iceland I wanted to tell you about Trekhill Isvik, and this is in the Strandia region. This is probably about 20, 30 miles north of Holmovic. It's part of Strandia, which is just one of the counties. That's it's a, an area, and this little spit of land housed, did ho host executions. But what was interested, it's very well documented. It's one of the few that has got full accounts of what happened. So in 1652, reports started circulating around an illness in Trekilisvik, which is in the north of Strandia. Documents described an evil spirit or demons possessing the whole of the village and they were causing turmoil, especially in church. So when a sermon was being read, it would cause women to belch very loudly. And we giggle at this and we giggle because there, there are so many farting spells in Icelandic magic at this time and belching spells. But at the time they deemed this to be quite sinister. It was embarrassing and humiliating, obviously, and especially if it was uncontrollable, but it was seen as being a demonic force that was causing this. Not that they their diet might've been a bit suspect or there could be something growing fungal on stored grain, none of that came to light. It was purely that demonic entities. So women's, women were belching and their stomachs were swelling while in the church. And it, it does state in the documents that virgins were particularly prone. There were up to 12 women had to be carried out in one sermon alone. And they began foaming at the mouth. There was a new sheriff in town. He arrived, his name was Mr. Courtson, and he took office and married into one of the most powerful families in the West Fjords. He investigated, and in 1654, he took evidence to the parliament. So he, he went, although there were small judicial practices, so um, trials could take place in these villages, when it was something really serious, they took it back to the Alpingi and took it to parliament to be addressed. So he took this because he found, or he thought, that one man in particular, Mr. Gad Brunson, was the cause. He admitted, this man who'd been accused, he admitted that he had secured the devil in the shape of a fox. Now the thing is with foxes, they were a big threat to the livelihood and to food in this area. So seeing a fox was akin to seeing the devil himself. But he said that he'd seen a fox and he'd seen the devil in the shape of a fox and sent him to Trekilisvik. Another man then admitted he killed a sheep with magic. He said he'd used magical forces and the sheep had died and that he could get the devil to do whatever he wanted to. The parliament decided that this particular sheriff was absolutely right. These these accusations were true and both were burned on a fire on the 20th September in 1654. So these are the kind of accusations that were in circulation. We're fortunate that they've been documented but now we read back some of them just seem ridiculous or atrocious that somebody is executed for something so trivial or unfounded or untrue. But back then this would be seen belching swollen stomachs and a fox would all be seen as demonic and the only way to deal with it would be to assume it's witchcraft. So the process of accusation. Somebody was accused by somebody in the community. Generally it was after misfortune or directed at somebody they didn't particularly like and that's all it took. That was it. The accused person then had a real tough time because they had to prove their innocence. So they could do this in one of three ways. They could have someone swear their innocence. So somebody who was really important, a judge, one of the members of parliament or somebody in high esteem could swear their innocence because they wouldn't doubt somebody who was held in high esteem. They could convince the jury, which was 12 people, 12 men generally, 
they could convince this jury of their innocence individually. So they could approach each of the members of the jury and persuade them that they were innocent in whatever way they could manage. Or the most difficult, prove beyond any doubt that they were not a sorcerer. How they were supposed to do that, there's no record, but that was one way they could do it. So if they were found innocent, if the, if the judge decided, and I say judge loosely because the judge was generally a man of God, it was a priest, a vicar, a bishop. If they were found innocent, case dismissed. If they were guilty, the case would be dealt with there and then. So that they didn't have a trial and then a chance to prove their innocence. They had to do all that before the trial. And then if they were found guilty, a man of God would order the burning. So whoever was presiding would order the burning and it would take place immediately. So they would go and gather belongings of the accused to be executed, or they might gather together driftwood and they would take them outside and burn them there and then. The man of God, whether it's a bishop, a vicar, a priest, would then take possession of any of their material belongings that they wish to. So you could argue there was a little bit of corruption there. Um, they, they were entitled to their holdings. So yeah, well, make of that as you will. I want to talk about some of the accused and their crimes. I'm going to talk a little bit more about some of the more well-documented cases. But these are some of the things that they were accused of. So, for example, Jan Rogner Valdson was burnt in 1652. He was accused of raising a ghost and they found papers with runic characters on them. He denied all accusations he was burned. Sigurda Johnson, burnt in 1671, he admitted that he'd fought a ghost and he'd frightened it with herbs and his own semen and that was enough to seal his death. Ari Paulson, burnt in 1681, he had no one to swear his innocence and his only crime was that he admitted to knowing how to find out if a woman was a virgin or not. So that accusation and that confession caused him to be burnt at the stake. It's also worth mentioning that um, this, there were other crimes that held execution. Um, there was drown, execution by drowning, execution by hanging, but burning was deemed to be the most severe and held only for witchcraft cases. Some of the executions went slightly wrong and the ropes burnt before the accused was dead. They leapt from the flame saying they were innocent, they were innocent and obviously thrown back onto the fire. It was horrendous, it was horrific. Now I want to tell you about the Reverend Paul Bjornsson, just to highlight this idea I have of um, power going to people's heads. He was a pastor and he was believed to be one of the most learned men in Iceland during his time. He wrote famous sermons, he navigated, he was a navigator, he wrote in Greek and Latin, he's believed to have corresponded with many European scholars. He also wrote in 1674 a treatise on magic, which was drawing heavily on the Malleus Maleficarum. But he, he believed that Icelanders could then have an acquaintance with witchcraft so they could understand what was going on. And this was in the heat of, of the witch trials and the age of fire. Paul's half-brother, was sheriff in one of the counties and he also pursued witchcraft with zeal. He loved his work and had a, a lot of cases of witchcraft. So he was responsible for quite a few executions. In 1669 the Reverend Bjornsson's wife claimed that they had a ghost in the house that was causing havoc, it was opening and shutting doors, slamming doors, and she felt ill for a period of probably around six months. Her name was Helga. She then decided that this was all an infliction because she hadn't allowed a young man called John Leifson to marry one of her maids. So she pointed the finger at him and he admitted that he tried to learn a little bit about the occult, but other than that, he hadn't done anything wrong, but she pointed the finger, her brother-in-law, went through the whole process, the judicial process, 
and he was burnt at the stake. A little while later, um, because of course this is Reverend Paul Bjornsson and if he said things were going wrong, they believed him. He was a man in authority. Five years later, Helga fell ill again. So she was ill once more, um, but also two of her sons fell ill at the same time. And as a result, she accused two men this time um, and two of them were burnt. It was thought that her brother-in-law, the sheriff, pushed the sentence through very quickly. In the documents I've read, it seemed that this happened incredibly quickly. Soon after, in 1678, there was also the only female burning, and that was because she was, Helga suffered again, pointed the finger, this time at Puridor Olofstotia, and she said that it was her that had made her ill. It was her, her fault and because of her brother-in-law and her husband, Puridor was burnt at the stake, the only female in Iceland to be executed as a witch. In 1683, yet another man was accused of causing illness to the family, but this time it was the daughter of Reverend Paul and Helga. And it's interesting because in documents of that time, contemporary documents, people wrote about this family and wrote about the daughter I don't have a name here, um, but they said that she was quite nervous, she was very um, quite reserved, but that she was really liked to drink. So she was recorded as having quite a lot to drink quite frequently. Not that that could have been the cause of her being ill, of course. Um, it was demonic forces, but her being ill meant that Svein Arneson was accused of causing her to be ill despite all the things that were written at the time and he was the last man to be burnt in Iceland in 1683. So as you can see when you've got power in a family you've got somebody who's a sheriff, somebody who's the man of God who makes the decision, the final decision, you don't stand much of a chance. The Kirkubol trial was another one which is very well documented and as I said we're very fortunate because most of these are. This was also quite interesting for the reason that um, it shows the greed associated with these trials. So a father and son were accused of cursing a priest, Pastor John Magnuson. Um, he was believed to have had a sickness and both were executed together. So a father and son were executed on the same pile. This happened quite a lot because resources were scarce in Iceland. They didn't want to use up wood that was so precious for the winter months. So they burnt them together or used their belongings to burn and create the fire. And this was in 1656. Compensation was given to Pastor Magnuson. So he had all of their material holdings, but that wasn't quite enough. So he decided to accuse the daughter. Word was spreading that John Magnuson's methods and his rationale was not quite um, appropriate, for want of a better word. And it was brought to the, the Alpingi and they looked at this and said, this is just ridiculous. You can't just accuse the daughter because they suspected he was after her, her belongings. So the case was dismissed. But what happened was the daughter then put a case against them for wrongful accusation and she was awarded Pastor Magnuson's belongings. So he, she did get compensation and in some way she did get what was back from her father and her brother. They totally dismissed his case in court, but he did insist on writing a book. So we've got Pastor Magnuson's book of this whole account of the process which he went through. And this is why it's so well known. But as always, there are two sides to the story. Um, many, many of the illnesses that were explained, it could have been that illnesses were through malnutrition, they could have been illnesses through consumption of corn infected by fungus, similar to what happened in Salem, but it's highly unlikely it was witchcraft. So I just wanted to list the names of the 20 executed men and the one woman. So Puridur is the female, which was 1678, her execution. So it was a period of just over 30 years where these, were, these executions took place. But when you think that 10% of all accused were executed, it's very high, a very high proportion. 
but very well documented. We do have many documents and pamphlets from witch trials in this country, but in Iceland we have a little bit more, which I'll now talk about. So these were turbulent religious times. We've got Christianity spreading, but traditional beliefs fighting against this. However, in 18th century, the Lackey volcano erupted violently and killed a massive proportion of the population. This was then followed by famine due to the death of the livestock and another quarter of the population died. So accusations of witchcraft just disappeared. Although there were the occasional one, it didn't really happen very much after this. I think the population communities had far more to worry about than accusing people. They gained independence in the 1940s from Denmark, but retained close ties. But today, Icelandic nationalism is really trying to revive the importance of the sagas. And the sagas are the stories of the Norse traditions of these ways. So it's really important. They're holding on to their culture and reviving it, which is lovely to see. So documents survive. We're really fortunate they survive from throughout the witch trials and beyond. The representatives of God I mentioned, whether it was bishops, pastors, vicars, they kept meticulous records of the trials, but they also had their own diaries. So we've got diaries from these people as well as the official court records. People accused were often found with Galdra box or magic books, but they were hidden on, and should they be found when somebody was accused, they tended to be burned with them because they were, people were fearful of them. They didn't know how much power or magic they held. However, there are seven original Galdra box in survive, that survived. Also, many magic books were copied. So the tradition of copying books did carry on so we do have access to the runes and again they're adapted they've changed slightly but they're still very similar to their historic predecessors from four or five hundred years before the drawings are just some some of the images that you find and they're beautiful beautiful little images and the helm of ore as i said it's now the symbol of strandia but you'll find it often in the books this is pages during the witch trials this one right through so they started in 60 the execution started in 1652 ended in 1683 and this particular book was through that whole period and these are the notes of one of the bishops often they start writing in latin and then write in icelandic these magical symbols were very rarely copied out and drawn. This bishop in particular did write, as you can see on the page on the left, he did record the symbols that had been found in the accused's house. They didn't often do this because there are records where men of God, bishops, priests, accused other men of God of being practitioners of sorcery as well. And should they be found to have drawn out runes, that was obviously a sign that they were, so they tried not to draw them out very often. However, this one did survive, and you can see the drawings of this particular bishop from his diaries. These are pages from the court records. So they start in Latin, as I said, then go into Icelandic. And if you look at the page on the right, those are all the signatures. So everybody who was present at the trial had to sign, and then the bishop or the priest or the vicar would then order either execution, incarceration or um, free, give them their freedom. But everybody had to sign. And again, these books are all held, they're available. The magic books or the Galdra box, seven in existence from this time. Some later ones are also available. This is one of the very early ones. It's beautiful, it's in, made in skin, it's got vellum pages very fragile, very small. It's probably about um, maybe four inches across, six inches down, very small, but beautifully preserved. If you are interested, it's the only one that's been translated fully and you can buy that from the Museum of Sorcery and Magic in Iceland. They do now do, they've got an online shop now and they do do international postage, but you've got a full facsimile of the Galdra Bok and a full translation in English. So it's, it's well worth it in a, its actual size as well. So just a small little box, slip cover with these two in it. That's the only one that's actually been translated right the way through. There are just some more 
pages with the spells. So we can still have access to the spells, which have very little changed over the centuries. This is a book from the late 19th century. Again, this tradition of copying it out. So although the symbols have changed a little bit, they're still very much the same as the Galdra box from the 17th century. Maybe a few spells added, maybe some of the symbols have been modified, new ones added for as time developed. Um, but this is, this is currently on display in the Museum of Iceland, but it's lovely to have access to these documents. Most of the bishops' diaries, the court records are held at the National Archives, which are in Reykjavik. This is the picture outside. Um, you can go and visit. They will dig them all out for you. And thankfully, I had a translator with me so they could help me massively. The Galdra box themselves, they're held at the University of Iceland at the main library in Reykjavik. But they're mainly on display in museums. So although they're held, they're historically held by the library, they can, they're generally on display, so you can see them. And of course, there is the Museum of Witchcraft and Magic in Iceland. And going back, I mentioned the sagas, which are the stories of the Norse myths. Um, this was placed, this museum was chosen because it's believed that in one of the sagas, somebody comes out of the fjord and this is where they land, so that's where it was. Well worth a visit, well worth a trip. It documents the history of witchcraft in Iceland throughout the centuries, but also has many artefacts and spells that are traditional Icelandic spells because any, any magic, any spells are relevant to the communities they serve. So here, the, most of the spells link to the sea and to gaining land and to survival. I could not go past, so we're up to date now, we're into the museum. This image on the left, these are very famous. If you're squeamish, don't look too closely. They're called the necro pants. Um, they're well documented. It's believed that if somebody is dying and they give you permission to take their skin, you take the skin from the waist down and it has to be totally intact, no holes. So the skin is taken off you then put them on as a pair of tights and you put coins in the scrotum. This will then bring you wealth throughout your life. Before you die, you can pass these on, but to pass them on, you have to find somebody who's willing to take them in the first place. And when you take them off, you mustn't, they mustn't totally leave a human body. So you take one leg out, they put theirs in and you transfer the wealth across. These are replica, they're not real skin, can I just say, so they're not um, flayed skin on display. But it, it's quite a well-known, well-known spell in Icelandic magic. The image at the bottom right is for controlling the wind. So runes are drawn on a bone, placed in this fish's mouth, and then the, the head is directed at which way you want the wind to come from. The higher the head is placed, the more strong the wind will be. In museums, you always get the living dead, anything to do with the occult. There's always somebody coming out of the ground. So I put that one in. There are more of some pages from spell books, customary crow or raven. And then this spell at the bottom is for bringing in wealth. What happened in Iceland, it was very difficult. There were landowners and it was really hard to gain wealth because people controlled the land. So there's very little chance of people just you know, the general community having land. So this is a spell called the sea mouse spell. Um, the idea was that you catch the carnivorous sea mouse, which is a small creature. You then carve the ring helm on the skin of a black tomcat and use the menstrual blood of a virgin to draw it. You catch the sea mouse in a net made from a virgin's hair and keep it in a wooden box. The ring helm must be laid over the mouse to prevent it escaping. If a stolen coin is then laid in the box, the sea mouse will draw money from the ocean, so it will bring you wealth. If it should escape, it will dive back in the ocean and cause dangerous and devastating storms and the loss of many lives. So quite a serious spell to have, but quite um, a well-used one. So today there are our English language resources. These are two books. There is very little on the historic side of it. So um, I'm hoping to write 
about this um not that much has been translated and not much on the historical context of witchcraft but there is a little bit in both of these smith c smith's icelandic magic from 2015 or dr stephen flowers book from 2016 as well they cover the grimoires and they translate some of the spells there's also the book of staves which artists are now exploring iceland as a, a great place for linking art symbols and landscape or you can i recommend these two books caroline lee's the glass woman is set in historic iceland when the witch trials were on or is the Sigurd Dottir's book Last Rituals is a contemporary um, crime fiction novel. So Iceland is coming into the fore a little bit more if you are interested. <laughs>